It's our honor and pleasure to have Dr. Susanna Price with us today in uh, uh, this uh, conference. And Dr. Susanna Price is well-known intensivist and cardiologist. At, uh, she is working right now in Royal Brompton Hospital, and she is an honorary uh, le senior lecturer in Imperial College Hospital. Dr. Susanna Price will start her presentation like unusual for us to ask a question before the presentation, not after. So the question is, does the critical care echo change it at any given time, your management plan, Dr. Susanna Price? Okay, Mike. so thank you very much for the invitation. Can I just check, firstly, you can see my slides okay? And you second, see. you can yeah. hear me. We hear you very well. Perfect. Uh, so thank you so much for the invitation. It really, really is a total pleasure to be here today. And I'm going to try and answer that question. I have no conflicts of interest related to this or any other studies. So I work in a very specialist cardiac center, so I can go to the cardiac magnetic resonance scanning, or I can go to CT, or I can do, and I can do whatever I want. So why do I use echocardiography? I will use whatever modality I need to answer the question, but mostly it's because it's safe. You can do it by the bedside. You get an instant answer, and it usually will tell you what it is that you want to know, provided you use it right. The second is it's been around a very long time. It's extremely well validated. We know what we're doing with echocardiography, and we can use it as an adjunct to what we do with our other investigations. And then also it has applications that have been more or less well validated right across the whole of the critical spectrum. So those are the reasons that I use echocardiography and I will reach for it. It's safe. You don't have to move the patient anywhere. It has many applications that are very well validated. And then when you look at what you can use it for, you can use it as a monitor, so you can measure cardiac output, cardiac index, you can estimate left-sided and right-sided pressures, you can look at myocardial perfusion, and also you can look at anatomy. So it's a super versatile tool. And what you need to do is use it to the level that you're at. So this is a sort of standard hierarchy of progression through uh, echocardiography training. The first two are really regarded as focused cardiac ultrasound. It's not co comprehensive. And somewhere between level one and level two sit the certification and accreditations for echocardiography. And then at level three, they're the sort of people who are doing echocardiography research. So you need to know your level to be safe. So now I'm gonna answer your question. How, do, how does it change my practice? And what I've done is I took one week in my ICU just prior to COVID. And then I took one day and I looked at the echoes that we did and saw whether they changed our practice or not. And it gives you a flavor of the sort of things we get. So my first patient I've got for you, she's 38 years old. She's nine weeks pregnant. She's very unlucky. She's had cardiogenic shock. She's just getting better. She's on uh, three different inotropes and pressors. She's got a history of SLE, Raynaud's and Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And the question was raised, should we add in some intravenous immunoglobulin or some cyclophosphamide for her myocardial function? This is a presumed SLE uh, myocarditis. So we looked at our global and circumferential strain and it's not entirely normal. Remembering this lady's nine weeks pregnant, are we going to give IVIG? Are we going to give cyclophosphamide? Are we going to do nothing in addition to the steroids? It is mildly down. The lady's catastrophically sick. We have a long discussion with the SLE doctors and we decided to go for IVIG and she made a full recovery. So did it make a difference? Yes, it did. Okay, my second patient, remember this is on one day, 57 year old man, he's post aortic dissection repair, he has a low cardiac output state, and the question is, does he need mechanical circulatory support, and if so, what does he need? So we do a transesophageal echocardiogram, and you can see that his left ventricle is very uh, hyperdynamic, it's small, the right ventricle is large, he has catastrophic tricuspid regurgitation, uh, we're measuring his cardiac index, it's very low. We measure the VTI on the left side, it's six. So that's very, very low indeed. We measure the total isoblumic time on the left. So it's eight, so it's the, heart, the left heart is super efficient probably because it doesn't have enough preload. 
And from all of those things, we decide that yes, he does need mechanical support. And here we, you can see we've gone for a Protec Duo. So you can see the transesophageal probe. And this is like a big pulmonary artery catheter and you can put an oxygenator in it if you, if you like. And this patient again, made a full recovery. So did echo change what we do? Yes, it did. Okay, the third echo. So my fellow and I were quite busy this day. He's 36 years old, he's got group A strep, he's got septic shock with multi-organ failure. And the thing that's different today is that his liver function is going off big time. Everything else looks like it's gonna be recoverable, but his liver it is really bad. So the question then is to look towards the right heart. We can see that he's got um, a good cardiac index, he has septic shock. He's got pulmonary hypertension, his pulmonary artery systolic pressures. 52, his venous pressure is very high. We're ventilating him relatively aggressively and his gases aren't great. And this is a pulmonary um, artery Doppler using pulse wave Doppler. And you can see um, that there's a decent uh, right-sided VTI, but also you can see a pre-systolic A wave. So this patient has features of right heart restriction. They also have pulmonary hypertension. So we're gonna add in some anti-pulmonary hypertensives and if that doesn't work, then what we're gonna to have to do because we can't ventilate this patient any more aggressively is we would consider whether we should give this patient VV ECMO. Next patient, 42 year old man, he's had a PCI, he's supported with peripheral VA ECMO. The question then is, have we achieved what we want, wanted to do with our VA ECMO? So this is using very simple echo techniques. So we've done continuous wave Doppler across the mitral and we've done a M mode across the mitral annulus. Actually, this is showing you the septal one, but it was the same everywhere. And the striking thing you see with the mitral regurgitation, it's very, very long duration. It's not severe, but it's 866 milliseconds. That's very, very long. And that is an indicator that you may have some kind of dysynchrony. If you look at your M mode, you've got clear post ejection shortening. So despite VA ECMO, this left ventricle is still ischemic. So this patient needs aggressive um, unloading plus double check again, the coronaries are still all right, coronaries are okay. We put an impeller in this patient and his, his heart eventually recovered. So the echo was fundamental in changing what we did. Then we had a 32 year old patient who came back in the afternoon and the patient had had a pulmonary valvuloplasty. They were a congenital patient who had quite tight pulmonary stenosis. And at the end of the case, the anaesthetist said they had hemorrhage coming up the endotracheal tube. So the question was, is this reperfusion pulmonary edema or is there a localized issue related to what the interventionalist has done? They've had wires down the pulmonary arteries, they've been blowing up balloons. And what we saw, we saw widespread B lines everywhere. So this is reperfusion pulmonary edema. We can be very relaxed. We ventilate the patient and we wait and it will get better. Okay, next up, we have a 16 year old influenza A on VV ECMO, the oxygenation is inadequate. So the two things we can do now is upgrade the ECMO or do we give beta blockade? You know, do we need a different, an additional cannula or do we beta block the heart? So this is influenza A and you can see the lungs, unlike the COVID lungs that we're seeing now, are really loculated and very much destroyed at subcostal view. The patient has a small unloaded left ventricle. They have a large right ventricle, which is struggling. So to beta block this patient would not be safe. What the patient actually needs is an upgrade to VA ECMO, which is what they had. Unfortunately, they didn't survive due to the excessive uh, lung injury they had. Patient number seven, 45 year old pulmonary hypertensive, come to our um, ICU to say, uh, can we do anything else? They have cardiogenic shock. What actually can we do? And what we can do here is we can use echo as a monitor to see whether our pulmonary vasodilatation is actually making a difference. So on the left hand side, you've got the pulmonary Doppler. On the right hand side, you've got, very, again, very simple echo parameters that are sometimes enough. And you can see initially you've got a very short pulmonary acceleration time of 52 milliseconds. It's notched. The stroke distance is very, very low. And the TAPSI is very low at 1.3. Remember, this patient's on inotropes. And with sequential adding of pulmonary vasodilator therapies, 
the pulmonary acceleration time gradually prolongs, the TAPSI increases now to 2.3, and the stroke distance improves, and the patient has resolved cardiogenic shock. So in this patient, it was a very useful monitor to can tell us to continue adding pulmonary vasodilators until we got to where we wanted to be. Patient number eight, we were asked to look at dilated cardiomyopathy, had had an ICD implant and had arrested after the ICD implant um, and developed pulmonary edema and a low cardiac, more low cardiac output state. So they sent the patient to us to say, could we, uh, should, um, should we just ventilate the patient and leave him or do we really need to resynchronize this patient now? So this is a little bit of uh, echophysiology. So we measure the TAE index of 1.9. And then we calculate the total isovolumic time. So you can see on the left side, your ejection time is 20 milliseconds. You've got a heart rate of 104. So your total ejection time for any minute is 20.8 seconds in a minute. And on the right hand side, you've got mitral regurgitation. And between that, you have the available filling time for the left heart. And that gives you a filling time over a minute of 18.9. So the total isovolumic time, so the wasted time, neither filling nor emptying in this patient is 20 seconds in every minute. It should be 12 or less. So this patient may benefit. So what we did was we took the patient back to the cath lab and they uh, resynchronized the patient in terms of AV delay. So that um, reduced the total isovolumic time now to just about 17. Then we looked at VV delay and reduced the total isovolumic time to below 12 and gave the patient an aortic VTI of 15. So rather than just ventilating and using inotropes, we recognized electromechanical dyssynchrony and said, get on and do that and the patient will benefit. Our penultimate patient, she's 36, she has peripartum cardiomyopathy, she's on VA ECMO and we're hoping for recovery. So here we're just playing around a little bit with echocardiography. This is a, a phonocardiogram and it's also an apex cardiogram. So you can visualize the heart sounds and you can also estimate the left ventricular end diastolic pressure from outside the heart. And it should be much less than a third of the total peak that you will get. You have to be able to obviously palpate and, and uh, ultrasound uh, the apex of the heart. And in this patient, it was around about a third. So what we did was we took the patient to the cath lab and we measured the LV end diastolic pressure it was 17, which is a little bit borderline for us in terms of hoping for recovery. So we did slightly more aggressive unloading of this ventricle. We um, added an impeller and the EDP dropped to about five or six and the ventricle recovered completely. So it's useful. You can play around with some fancy older techniques and they can give you some useful information as well. And then finally, an influenza B, she's 18 years old. We can't get her off VV ECMO because every time we turn the sweep gas off, she desaturates profoundly. So is it the lungs? Is it the cannula? Is it the heart? And here you can see, this is a picture of the intraatrial septum. She has a very, very small fossa rivalis. And you can see the cannula doesn't go across the septum, but the jet, the return jet from the VV ECMO um, goes, is directed into the left atrium. So every time they turn the sweep gas off, They've got four liters a minute of deoxygenated blood, probably about half of that going into the left side of the heart. So that completely explains why the patient won't wean. You pull the cannula back, turn off the gas, gas sweep and the patient doesn't desaturate and you can wean them perfectly well. So that's just one day. So in all of those patients, yes, of course it changed how we manage the patient, but you really do need to know your setting. So you need to know your extracorporeal support if you're in a cardiac center. You need to know what complications you're concerned about, not just the echo ones, but what is the risks of the uh, intervention that you're doing. You need to know what the cardiologist is actually able to offer. So they are, are they able to offer percutaneous uh, clip devices? Are they able to offer TAVI? Are they able to offer extracorporeal support? So you need to know the full range of what's, uh, what's on offer. And if you don't put it into context, and if you don't really do a proper echocardiogram, you can get it wrong. So here are some nice examples of where it wasn't entirely right. Let me put it that way, if I'm gonna say it nicely. So on the top, you've got three different patients who were all referred to us for our respiratory ECMO service. Um, and they all had uh, hypoxia. And they'd all had echoes that were reported as normal in their referring hospitals, transthoracic echoes. The patient on the top left had an undiagnosed ABSD with bidirectional shunting. The patient in the middle 
They'd relied on suboptimal images. They said the left ventricle was very good, but actually they had um, ruptured cordy to the posterior leaflet at P2 and it was flail. They had severe MR and the patient needed a mitral repair. And on the top right, it was a patient who'd had a previous mitral valve replacement. And this left ventricle just from the end mode is too good, it is too dynamic. You've got normalization of septal motion. And on TOE, you could see that he had a paraprosthetic leak. In the middle, we have a young patient who has a Ewing sarcoma. He has had uh, surgery and now presents with a hemothorax. And when they turn him on one side, he promptly arrests. And the question is why? And here we've done TT, the TTE was pretty unexciting, uh, but the transesophageal revealed exactly why. So these are the right-sided pulmonary veins that you can see are relatively uh, stenotic or appear stenotic, but actually it's not, because, not that they're stenotic. What's happened is when they turn the patient left side up, the mediastinum has moved with the hemothorax and the residual tumor, and it's caused torsion of the pulmonary veins to the right lung, which is the ventilated lung. You've got great venous return from the left lung, but it's not ventilated at all. So what you have to do is turn the patient on the other side and do whatever procedure you have to do in a different position. And on the bottom, you have two different patients. Uh, bottom left is a patient who was in catastrophic cardiogenic shock. They thought the patient had a right ventricular infarction, which actually they did do. Um, and they put the patient on VA ECMO. Uh, when the patient was retrieved back to our hospital, we had a look not just at the right heart, but also the left heart, and they missed a ruptured uh, papillary muscle. And the patient then went on to have surgery and did very well. And on the bottom right, you can see a patient who'd repeatedly failed over weeks to wean from ventilation, and they had marked interventricular dyssynchrony, which was able to be solved with implantation of biventricular pacemaker with ready weaning. So if you don't have everything at your fingertips and you don't understand the context, you can get it very wrong and you can make the wrong recommendations. So the things that I ask myself if I'm trying to answer the question of how to manage the patient or how to advise, the treating intensivist. The first thing is to know the clinical context and then to know what is it that the treating clinician really, really wants to know. And then you have to be fairly honest. Can you answer it with echo? And it's, can echo answer it? And then the second question is, can you answer it with your echo skills that you've got? And be really honest because you mustn't overstate, otherwise you will get things wrong. Always check the underlying diagnosis, make sure that that's right. Have a look at how the patient is ventilated how they're sedated, how they're supported. Be systematic about the way you work your way around the heart and look for additional relevant information and make sure you have the appropriate expertise. So here at the bottom right, you can see a color M mode of a heart and it looks like very mild aortic regurgitation from this, but if the heart stops ejecting, you put them on VA ECMO, it becomes significant. So always be systematic, always look for the reversible. I think um, this is my old guide and mentor who sadly, uh, no longer with us, uh, Professor Tim Evans, one of the greatest intensivists in the UK. And his question was always, who did the echo? So he wants to know how expert the person is that has done it. And I think the other thing uh, to remind ourselves is uh, the great and wise words from Joss Rowland, who was another one of my teachers, that the real benefit of echo here is not the technical ability. You need to have it, of course, but what you need to do is think you need to get the information you need to be able to communicate and your teamwork for here is absolutely essential. So my final real take home point, so the answer is yes, of course, everything you can change provided you use it right. Be careful if you're using echocardiography on the ICU, it's not the same as focus. Make sure you know the literature and you stay up with it. Don't, don't be um, applying echo techniques when they're not really applicable. Make sure you have everything at your fingertips, or if you don't, you know somebody who has. And make sure you are really addressing what the treating clinician needs to know, not just what you can find out from your echocardiogram. And in order to be able to do this, you're gonna to have to do a lot of it, and you're gonna to have to get yourself really, really well trained. So you can move from where you are now to actually where you can do some really fantastic stuff with critical care echocardiography. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Susanna. It was very, very nice uh, presentation and collection gathering of uh, very interesting cases. To prove the, the statement that everybody in critical care with the interest in critical care echo has gaining since a couple of years now that it makes change 
in the management plan. And I'm sure that everyone from the panelists here has a day or another with a case similar to yours. And, and we conclude at the end of the day that probably, I don't know if you agree with me, Dr. Susanna Price, if we have to make it routine in ICU to have a lock with critical care echo integrated ultrasonography exam for every critically ill patients, regardless if you have a straightforward uh, indication or not? So do we need to echo everybody? Well, we, I, as I say, I work in a specialist cardiothoracic center. So we do echo every patient that's admitted to our ICU. Absolutely. So we know what we're dealing with. We've had too many times, um, if you rely on what other people have said, so if you have a transfer in, um, sometimes they won't have the ability or the um, access to advanced imaging techniques, particularly um, in some of the smaller hospitals, certainly in the UK, many of them don't have uh, high quality out of hours echocardiography. Some of them don't have access to transesophageal. So you have to know your centers, you have to know what they've got available and it's not a criticism of them, it's just your research, you're just checking the information when they come in. It's like you always re-examine the patient, it's no different. Um, and then it's based on the clinical progress. If you are concerned the patient isn't making the progress or that, that, that you would expect something has changed, they've become hemodynamically more unstable or they're failing to wean, then we'd have a look. But we do always uh, image at baseline so we know what's happening with our patients. But going back to, I work in a specialist cardiothoracic unit, so these patients have all got bad stuff wrong with their hearts and lungs. Great. Uh, I think uh, from the panelist, uh, Walid Al-Habashi uh, 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 has a question. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much for this outstanding, three perfect presentation, uh, Prof. Susanna. And it's my honor actually to be trained nine or 10 years back in Riyadh under yourself and one focus with Dr. Arif Hussain. So nice to see you back. Uh, my question is, it's always in ICU pneumonia versus heart failure. And it's not legitimate to put a Swangans catheter for every one of those patients to diagnose is it pneumonia and heart failure and there's no actually perfect diagnostic modality how you find is this the question how you find the ee prime guides diastolic dysfunction in the term of diagnosing heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction to say this is a heart failure what is this accuracy of this test if i don't have a diagnostic Swangans or pulmonary artery flotation catheter in situ Thanks so much. Okay, so uh, it's a great question. And um, I, the, 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 the short answer is it's not that reliable. You can't rely on it on, on its own. Um, you have to, if you're going to use uh, Doppler parameters to estimate, so your question really is actually, is this um, pulmonary edema or is this pneumonia? So, and if you're thinking about pulmonary edema, Generally, the question is, is it that the left atrial pressure is excessively high? And the trouble with E over E prime, if it's used alone, its sensitivity and specificity is inadequate, even in the outpatient population. If you move towards the critical care population, it drops even further. You can use it in combination with, um, there's some nice um, papers by our colleagues from France looking at combination of uh, M mode color propagation velocities uh, combined with EE prime, combined with ejection fraction, combined with pulmonary uh, wave uh, Doppler, pulmonary vein do Doppler, and used in combination, they can tell you that it's very high or they can tell you that it's very low. The trouble is it doesn't tell you about the bit in between. And then frequently your patient may have two things wrong with them. So they may have pneumonia and an abnormal left ventricle. And so you, you can't say, well, it's just pneumonia and the ventricle's abnormal, it's not relevant. It may be extremely relevant and it may be dynamic. I would point you towards, there was a very, very good article written by Alan Fraser in Echocardiography, I think published in either September or October this year, looking exactly at this problem, not just in outpatient, but also moving towards critical care and walking through the actual practical limitations when it comes to it, and then thinking about what does it really mean? Uh, what do I do if I'm trying to tease it out? So the first thing is I do use lung ultrasound. Um, and I can, I've had patients where 
it's been very clear that this is not pulmonary edema. There is there's something else, an inflammatory process going on in the lung. Um, and I use lung ultrasound combined with echocardiography. So, it, and it may be, and we saw it quite a lot um, with the H1N1 pandemic. And interestingly in the UK now we're seeing much more in the second wave of the COVID pandemic is that we're seeing more left ventricular involvement, much, much more left ventricular involvement, generally late down the line. So the patients still have abnormal lungs, but the left ventricle is not normal. And then it may either progress to a fulminant uh, cardiac failure or actually just be sitting there with LV dysfunction. So I think you have to use both and you can't rely on one parameter on its own. It's not, not good enough. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, Professor Susanna Price again. Uh, thank you, Thomas Prislin. Thank you very much, Dr. Walid Chibbe. It was very, uh, Dr. Walid Habashi. It was very nice session, very informative. And we're going to have uh, 10 minutes break. So mind your agenda to just shift the program five minutes later. So we're going to meet exactly after 10 minutes from now, wherever you are in, in the world. So please. Uh, uh, you can enjoy this 10 minutes for a cup of coffee or something. Just a good, uh, a kind, kind reminder to all our speaker in this uh, session to go through the Q&A and answer if there is any pertaining question to your presentation. Thank you very much. We were very happy to, ha to have you today, Thomas Preslin, Susanna Price, and everybody. Thank you. Hello, Hello Susanna. How are you? This is Daniel Lernstein. I'm very well, thank you. Great. Hello, Susanna. Oh, hello, 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 friends. Yeah, so, so. I have a question to uh, Professor uh, Susanna. Uh, but, okay. but this, this is the break time. This is you, the break time. Do I will write it to you. <laughs> you, can, you can just uh, uh, have a discussion in between, no problem but everybody else can have his break and can switch off the camera and mute himself if wish. Hisham, you can go ahead with Susanna Price. This is your time, no problem. 10 okay. minutes and we'll meet. Thank, Thank you. Regarding case four. Can you... we say cheese before that? Cheese, and we take a, take a photo. Is that okay? <laughs> we'll, we'll do that later on. Okay. You can do it, do it now, Walid, if you wish. Okay, cheese. Cheese. Done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, my question was regarding case four. You were faced with a uh, left ventricular uh, ballooning, a patient with BCI and the peripheral ECMO, then uh, to vent the left ventricle opted to impella. Uh, this is this is a, a scenario we face. We, I'm working in a cardiac center, um, so my question regarding the timing for intervention and which intervention: uh, left atrial septostomy or impella, or shifting peripheral ECMO to central ECMO. Is there any factors in the echo which can lead the management to one of those? Uh, it's a it's a great question and it's a real it is a real problem. I think um, we've moved away very much. We used to uh, use intraaortic balloon pump in our pediatric patients. We still use a septostomy, but not in not in our adult patients. Um, and the there was some nice data, uh, particularly in the ischemics from Naveen Kapoor and his group that was published. I think uh, October in. It's either JAMA or circulation. And they looked at different modalities of extracorporeal support. And um, they had a swine model and they uh, went drilled down right into the molecular level and infarct size. Mm -hmm. And they showed that um, comparing intraortic balloon pump, VA ECMO and Impella in terms of infarct size um, and metabolic disruption of the heart, Impella was superior, and that's now been looked at in a number of clinical trials. We used to move, uh, go with just intraortic balloon counterpulsation, but um, the there are some for some patients, not not necessarily um, all of them, because the vascular issues are 
as you know, a big problem. Uh, so we were not getting inad we were not getting adequate offloading of the left ventricle, by which we mean we measure the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, and we're confident that that the LV EDP is low. So we now, if we have a patient with VA that we have rescued, we tend to use impeller for the ischemics. Mm -hmm. If it's left-sided heart, we use Protect for the right heart with or without an oxygenator. If it's biventricular, the patient's young, um, which means they're likely to do better, and it's predominantly left-sided disease. What we will do is we'll put a pediatric um, uh, pigtail in the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're in the cath lab. So you shoot the coronaries, sort the leg cannula, put a pediatric catheter in. If the LVEDP is low, we will leave the pediatric catheter in for 24 hours. So you can just leave it on a constant flush. Um, mm -hmm. Eventually it will clot and you have to take it out, just stops working, but it gives you a good idea for your first 24 hours. If the LVEDP is high, then we just put an impeller in straight away. We, do, we, don't, we don't wait anymore. And in particular, if the left heart is not ejecting, we would, we would offload. There's some nice data from Sean Harding and her group and that she's an isolated myocyte person amongst other things uh, that if you over unload the left ventricle that's almost as bad as over distending the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. So our, our, my, our myocytes were not made to be completely decompressed. They're, they need some tension um, and they're doing some nice studies looking at exactly that. So that's that's what we do. The timing of what you do and when we used to wait and see, but we don't anymore uh, because we had too many problems with legs. I think the next big discussion for the interventional cardiologists is: do they unload with the impeller first, or they do the PCI first? And mm -hmm. that we don't yet know. But there are two studies ongoing that should give us that answer. Okay, excellent. Regarding case nine, how long would you wait for the left ventricle to? recover. The lady was uh, uh, very part of cardiomyopathy. Um, so you can divide your patients into three groups, can't you? The ones that don't get better, the ones that slowly do get better, but the heart's not very good, and the ones that get better very, very quickly. Um, for the left side, if we're sitting on VA ECMO, we would get, if the, if the heart's showing no signs of recovery at all, and we do treat routinely with bromocryptine, that's our standard for yeah, yeah, this, yeah. Um, If the left ventricle is really not showing any signs of recovery at all at three and four days, we start having discussions with our longer term device colleagues. We would give the ventricle up to a week or, to, or 10 days. And then this question is, is it good enough? If it's not good enough, um, then these patients are generally in, our, in the UK, we don't have a destination VAD therapy program, it's not funded. Um, but these patients are usually fit and well otherwise and would be eligible for uh, transplantation. So what we try to do is have them awake on ECMO so we can talk to them, we can discuss um, what their options are. And if necessary, then we would transfer, transfer them to a longer term device. Uh, but we would we would start getting slightly anxious at about four or five days, and by a, a week to ten days, that's about as long as you want. So once you start the ECMO, as you know, your your clock is ticking. Uh, we wouldn't leave it longer than that. We have we have a lady. She was unlucky. She stayed with us in ECMO for forty days, and unfortunately, uh, the ex ex uh, transplant team uh, refused. Uh, we're not happy to. That, that's a, that's tragic. Yeah. Really. So, so yeah, I, we, we would expect to see recovery. Yeah, um, you know, four or five days is nice to see it. Makes you feel, yeah. gives you a warm feeling inside. Um, and but if you don't, that's not a disaster. But by a week or so, we would expect the right heart's a little different. Uh, but the but for the left heart, yeah, be about by a week. Definitely, you would want to be seeing something had changed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Total pleasure. Thanks. If you don't mind, can we assign, I send you some email about some policies for this? Yep. Total. All right. Thanks. No